Okay. Okay. Welcome to this week's session. This week we are going to be looking at basic understanding of correlations and how do we interpret the correlation uh, coefficients and then also how to uh, calculate some of the measures. But for your module, I don't think you are expected to do too much of the calculations than to be able to understand and interpret some of the solution. But we're going to cover all of them. And if there are calculations that you want, you feel like you 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 want us to go through them and in detail to explain them. Let me know, and then we can do that. So, by the end of the session today, you should be able to know how to draw up a scatter plot or what the scatter plot looks like. Uh, what is a correlation analysis? How to calculate and interpret? the coefficient of correlation, which is denoted by an R, and how to do a or conduct a correlation hypothesis analysis. And then we'll go through some of the typical questions you get from the exam or your assignment relating to the content. So a correlation, um, it's, a, it's a measure. Or a correlation, it, 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 it is a study of relationships. Let me put it that way. In order for you to know whether two uh, variables are related, you also need to understand that here we're only going to be talking about numerical variable. So correlational studies deals with numerical relationships between numerical values. So when you have two numerical values and you plot the values of those variable on an, uh, a scatter plot, which is an X and Y, it will show you the relationship of those two variables. And then a correlation analysis will then be a measure that comes from the calculations that you do. So it is a correlation coefficient or a correlation will give you a measure of that relationship, which will also tell you the strength of the relationship. So in terms of correlation, there are two things. You will understand the direction of the relationship by means of using the scatter plot or the sign. It, the sign also that you get from the coefficient of correlation can also tell you the direction, but you go in to measure the direction and also the strength in terms of the correlation coefficient, where it will tell you whether um, the, is it got a weak relationship or a stronger relationship in terms of the strength, but in terms of the direction, it will tell you whether it's going up or it's going down, it's increasing or it's dis decreasing. So. We're going to learn all those at a later stage. So correlation is only concerned with the strength of the relationship. And also uh, correlation is um, no causal effect is implied by correlation. There is no casual effect on that. So when you want to test the casual effect, there are some other techniques that you can use to look at the moderations and so on. So at this point, we only deal with correlation. So let's assume that we've got two variables, X and Y, and we have the measures. Uh, for the X variable, we have one, three, five, and uh, one. And for the X variable, we've got four, six, 10, and 12. Now, these two variables, they need to, we need to check if they are related. So let's assume that this is, the score that people receive um, for one test and the score that they receive for an aptitude test. So those are the two tests, the exam test uh, score and the aptitude score. So let's assume those are the two. So 
if we want to find out whether is there a relationship between the exam score and the aptitude test that students wrote, then we can plot the two values on an X and Y axis, where you also need to understand that the value of X is always going to be called an independent value, and the value of Y is what we call a dependent. So therefore, it means on the x-axis, that's where your indie, independent values will go. And on your y-axis, that's where your dependent values will go. So the other thing that you need to denote on a um, where you test for relationship, the two values needs to correspond to one another. So one corresponds with four. So when you draw up on the scatter plot, you need to read them as such. So on the X axis, we're going to identify the value of one. And on the Y axis, we're going to identify the value of four. And where they both meet, that will be where our point will be. Three and six, you do the same. Three and six, that will be the point. Five and 10, go to five and go to 10. That is the point, and 5 and 12, 5 and 12, that is the point, and 1 and 13, 1 and 13, maybe 13 is between 14 and 12, and that is the point. Once you have the points allocated on the scatter plot or on a Cartesian plane, then you are able to see what kind of a relationship that exists. And from here, you can also interpret this because as the value of your independent variable increases, as you can see, when it moves from one to three to five, the value of your dependent variable also increases with time. So it also is increasing. As I move from zero, from two to four to six to eight, you can see that your dots also increase with the numbers. So. This is one of one way of interpreting a scatter plot. As the value of x increases, the value of y increases. And later on, we're going to talk about the strength, which relates to whether is this a positive or this a negative uh, correlation. At the moment, we're going to just leave it as as the value of x increases, the value of y increases. Okay. That is scatter plot. And from a scatter plot, we can then create what we call a regression analysis. You not you should not worry about the regression analysis because in your module you don't touch regression. And when we build this line, it is what it is called the regression analysis or the regression line or the trend line, which also we can um, plot when we have a scatter plot. But for now, ignore that. So I've spoken to you about the strength of the relationship and that strength, we can calculate it by using the Pearson coefficient. Now, a Pearson coefficient is a measure of how well the relationship is described by the two variables, the X and the Y, which are measured on the same object, right? So let's assume that from our data that we have, we had our X and Y, in order for us to calculate the coefficient of correlation, there are a couple of things that we need to calculate. So on top of this, there is a bar. This is a Y bar, Y bar. There are a couple of things that we need to calculate. So the formula to calculate the Pearson, the Pearson coefficient, I will share with you just now what the formula looks like. So in order for us to calculate that, we need to calculate some of these measures. I've already calculated them on here, which is your X observation minus the X bar, which is the mean, your Y observation minus the mean of Y, your X and Y, your X squared and your Y squared. The mean, I calculated them by adding the total of your X observation, dividing them by how many they are. There are five, one, two, three, four, five divide by 15 divided by 5 gives us the mean of y. So in 
in this instance, x minus the mean of x will be 1 minus 3 will give us minus 2. 3 minus 3 gives us 0. 5 minus 3 gives us 2. And so on and so forth. When we look at the y, we add up all the y values. We get 45. Divide that 45 by 5, we get 9. So the mean of y is 5. So uh, 4 minus 9 is minus 5. 6 minus 9 is minus 3. 10 minus 9 is 1. And so on and so forth. And that will give us the values of x minus the mean of y. To calculate x, y, we say 1 times 4, which gives us 4. 3 times 6 gives us 18. And 5 times 10 gives us 50. Uh, 5 times 12 gives us 60. And 1 times 18 gives us uh, 13. And at the end, when we add all those values, they give us the summation of x and y. So this value here is what we call the summation of x and y. The same applies with x squared and y squared. We just, for the y squared, we just multiply the value of y by itself. So it's one times one, it's one. Three times three is nine. Five times five is 25. And one times one is one. Four times four is 16. Or you can use your calculator and say four squared, it will give you 16. Six squared, it will give you 36 and so on and so forth. And also when you calculate them, the sum or the total, this will give you the sum of x squared and the sum of y squared. And all those will be the values that we use to substitute into the formula. And how does the formula look like? So remember our table that we calculated. The formula for, the, for calculating the coefficient of correlation, which is a Pearson coefficient of correlation, and it is denoted by an R value is given by n multiplied by the summation of x and y. Remember, we calculated that the summation of x and y is what we calculated there. So it means we're going to substitute that value. Minus the summation of, of y, this will be the summation of x and the summation of y. So time minus the summation of x times the summation of y will be 15 times 45. Divide by the square root of your n, and we know that n is equal to 5 because when we count how many they are, they were 5, times the summation of x squared, and the summation of x squared is that value that we calculated. It's not summation of x and y. Of x squared will be 61. Minus the summation of x, and the summation of x is 15 squared. So these two values are totally different. Um, times n times the summation of y squared, so which will be the summation of y squared, it will be 465 minus the summation of y, which is 45 squared. And we substitute the values into the equation and we calculate and we find that the coefficient of correlation is 0 0.32, which is positive. And 0. Point, and if we uh, round it off to two decimal, we get 0 0.32. And this gives us the strength. And the strength of this relationship, we're going to interpret that right now, but it is also positive. We'll come back to this and, 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 and unpack what the study two means. So how do we then interpret the coefficient of correlation? From a scatter plot, right, you will be able to identify when the values of x and the values of y are increasing. We say the scatter plot is positive. But we also say, we also look at, so we look at that because the value of x and the values of y are increasing. We say it is positive, but in terms of the strength, we look at the strength. And if your value of your R coefficient is equal to one, we say it is perfect. If the scatter plot looks like this, but the coefficient of correlation is positive and the value of your R, which is your coefficient of correlation is 0, 0.18, we say this is a weak 
positive relationship. If this value was negative, we would say it is a negative, uh, it's a weak negative relationship. And we will come back to how we interpret these correlations. And looking at this scatter plot, which has the R coefficient of a 0.85 or 85%. And you can see when the values of X are increasing, the values of Y are increasing, and we say this has a strong positive relationship. And when we look at this next one, it also has an R squared of negative 92, which is higher. But if you look at the relationship, you can see that as the values of your x increases, the values of y decreases. It goes to the opposite direction. Therefore, we call this a strong negative relationship. How do we then define all that? Um, there is also what we call a coefficient of uh, determination, which is also called the R squared. And this is also an important statistic that indicates the variance in y that is attributed by the variance in the values of x. So we can take our r and put a square to it. So for this example, this r, we put r squared, which will be 1 squared, will be equals to 1, and we will say 100% of the variance in y are attributed by the variance in x, So for and so on. And we can interpret it in that way. So how do we use the values of the coefficient of correlation to interpret and come up with whether is it a positive strong relationship or is it a weak negative relationship? It goes with the sign which tells you the direction and it goes with the value of your coefficient of correlation which tells you the strength. So if your value of R is negative one, we say it is a perfect negative relationship. If it between um, 0 0.7 and 0 0.999, we say it has a strong negative relationship. If it's between 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5 and 0 0.7, we say it has a moderate relationship. If it's between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, we say it has a negative relationship. And if it has a value of 0 to uh, almost also 0 0.30, we say there is no relation. Actually, only when, when the value of R is equals to 0, we say it has no relationship. So usually, a value of negative 0 0.20, we can still also attribute some of the values and say it has a weak relationship. A 0 0.15, we can also still say it has a weak relationship. But when it's 0 0.05, a negative 0 0.05, we can also assume that this there is no relationship between uh, the value of your, your two variables. And vice versa, when it's positive, we say we put positive to it. We will say it is a weak positive relationship, a moderate positive relationship, and so on. So we will put the, the, the strength and the direction to it. And that's how you interpret the value of your Pearson correlation. Now, when it comes to hypothesis testing as well, so we need to test that the relationship exists, right? or there is no relationship. So your null hypothesis will always state that in this instance, our R is our sample statistic that we use. So our R is our sample statistic. If you learned from the beginning, when we introduced the concept, we introduced um, the measures that come from a sample are called statistics, and the measure that comes from a population, like a fee, this is a fee, fee like that. You can call it a fee or a pa, a phi, fee. A fee is what we call a parameter. Remember also that in your 
hypothesis statement, we always state your hypothesis statement using the population parameter. So your fee is your coefficient of correlation that gets calculated from the population. So our fee will be will say there is no relationship because the fee will be equals to zero. So fee will say there is no relationship between X and Y, and your alternative will state that there is a relationship because then the value of your fee is not equals to zero. Your correlation hypothesis testing will always be a non-direct a non-directional test. But even though when we interpret the results, we always going to interpret the results using mostly a one, a two tail or a, a non-directional test. Yes, we're going to use the non-directional test. So you also need to know how to calculate the test statistic, but in this instance, you don't really need to know how to calculate it in a way. But for us, in terms of the hypothesis testing as part of the steps, we know that there is a test statistic that we need to calculate and use the test statistic and the critical value to make a decision. And we need to also make sure that the value of your should be where your slow, your B1, which is your, in, your intercept, should not be equals to zero because or your slope. If your slope is equals to zero, then the value of R is the same as the value of your intercept, which will be at that point. Okay, so let's look at how we do the hypothesis testing. So if we need to test, test if there is an evidence of linear relationship between X and Y at a 5% level of significance, the first part, we need to state our null hypothesis and our alternative. Our null hypothesis states that there is no correlation or there is no relationship between X and Y. Your alternative states that correlation exists or your phi is not equals to zero. We know we were given an alpha of 0, 0,05 and we go and find the degrees of freedom, which is your n minus 2 because there are two variables. So you're going to divide minus 2 and you get 5 minus 2, which will give us 3 degrees of freedom. We go on and we calculate the test statistic, which is your R minus your fee. Your fee will always be equals to zero because uh, it's what we are given in our hypothesis statement. Your R squared, uh, remember we calculated the R squared and we found that the R squared was 0, 0,32. And then we substitute into the equation and calculate and we find that our test statistic is 0, 0,585. Now, in order for us to make a decision, we go and we find our critical value and create our, our regions of rejection. And when we go to the table, the t-test table, and because our correlation coefficient is uh, a two-tailed test, so we're going to find our two tails. Our, our region of rejection will be on both sides. And we were given alpha of 0, 0,05. So we divide alpha by 2, which then is your 0, 0,025. And we go to the t-table. We locate a 0, 0,025 at the degrees of freedom of 5. And we find that our critical value is 3,1824. Because we have two regions of rejection, we put one in the negative side and one in the positive, on the positive side and we create our regions of rejection. Anything that falls within the shaded area, we reject. Anything that falls in a white area, non-shaded area, we do not reject. We go back to our test statistic. We've got our critical value. We look at our test statistic and we find that our test statistic is 0, 0,58 and it falls in a white area. Therefore, we do not reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no sufficient evidence of linear 
association at 5% level of significant. So 0 0.32 in terms of the relationship, it clearly says there is no relationship between X and Y. So there is no sufficient evidence to, for us to prove that there is a relationship between X and Y. So going back to our relationship, uh, it says anything between 0 0.30 shows a weak relationship. And clearly when we do some tests, we can see we, we can also assume that a 0 0.30 can also mean no linear relationship. But we know that from interpreting the coefficient of correlation value, we can always say it is a weak one. Even if there is no sufficient evidence, but clearly they, it is a weak relationship that we can observe. Okay, so let's look at how questions are posed or asked during your assignment or in your exam. Questions can come in this manner. Is there no relationship at all between variable X and Y? What would be most likely value of the correlation coefficient r out of the following. So if there is no relationship at all, what will be the value of r? Is r going to be minus 1,0? Or it's going to be, there is a comma somewhere. It's missing a point where there is space, especially on the old papers. Or is it going to be number two, 0 0.5, or is it going to be option three, 0 0.3? And that is your question. Three. It's going to be three, yes, because three says your R is equals to 0, 0, and we know that with, if there is no relationship, the value of R is equals to zero. Some of the questions might come like this. A researcher suspects that children's level of anxiety during a test will intervene with their or interfere with their memories. He gives a list of items to be memorized to a sample of children and gives them a test to see how many items they can remember. Directly afterwards, he also gives them a test. Uh, he also tests them the level of anxiety of each child with an anxiety scale where a higher score shows a greater level of anxiety. The researcher draws a scatter plot of the relationship between anxiety and the level and the number of items recalled by the children. And the results are presented here. Looking at this scatter plot, the level of anxiety is our independent variable. The number of items are our dependent variable. What can the researcher infer about the relationship between the level of anxiety and the number of items remembered from the graph above? And can the researcher say there is, option one says, a negative relationship, therefore it means as the anxiety level or the anxiety rises, the items rises, the less items are remembered. Number two says a positive relationship as the anxiety falls, less items are remembered. Number three says a negative relationship, less items are remembered and as the num as the anxiety falls, and number four says no actual relation. The graph shows a negative trend over time. Which one would be? You can use also a process of elimination in this instance. One. It will be one because as the level of anxiety increases, the number of items are less, or the, there are less items that the, the, the children are remembering because 
if this is the high level of anxiety and this is your number of items, you can see that as the level of anxiety is higher, children are remembering fewer items, as you can see there. So therefore, it means option one is the correct one. Let's look at the next question, which also relates to the same information we read out. Suppose the researcher uses the data to calculate the Pearson moment correlation, which is R. Now we're going to look at the strength coefficient to determine the size of the relationship between the number of items remembered and the level of anxiety. Which of the following would be the most probable as a description of R? Which one of the following of the expected value of R seems to be most appropriate? Okay, I'm going to read out the sign with a meaning. So number one says the R, which is your coefficient correlation, is equal to zero. Therefore, it means there's no relationship. Number two says R is greater than zero. That means there is a positive relationship. And number three says R is negative zero. Therefore, R is less than negative zero. Therefore, there is a negative relationship. And R is not equal to zero. That means there is no relationship. Oh, there is a relationship. So, which one? Number one, number two, or number three? Is it three? It will be three because three says there is a negative relationship because the value of R will be less than zero. If you remember, I'm not sure if you still remember in primary school, we had a number line. Any value that is less than zero will be in the negative side. Any, any value that is greater than zero or bigger than zero will be in the positive side, right? And that is what I just used, the sign. Okay. Question four. A researcher hypothesizes that the drug treatment of hospitalized schizophrenic patients improves their mental alertness. He studies a random sample of 27 patients to see whether there is a relationship between the number of days of drug treatment and the patient scores on the mental alertness. What is the appropriate null hypothesis for this? relations or for this test. Now think about it. There is only one way and one way only of testing the hypothesis, especially for the and always remember we never use the sample statistic, but we use the population parameter. We not if we're talking about the relationship, we cannot use, especially when we've got two categorical values, number of patient score, we cannot use the mean because we're talking about the relationship. So it means that is not correct. We cannot use the sample statistic, so therefore that is not correct. I'm already giving you answers, right? Because if I cross out the first one, then the third one is also out. And your null hypothesis for this research would be, now, the other thing I want to bring with this question is that, remember previously we did hypothesis testing for two values for independent values, and we also use numerical values. Now, how do I identify from that question where I'm given independent uh, values for numerical values and 
on this one way I need to test where I'm also given two numerical values and one of them is independent. The keyword correlation, relationship, those are the keywords. On the other one where you use the t-test for two independent sample, the keyword there is, is there a differ, a difference? So that will be your keyword on the other side. On this one, your keyword, when they talk about the relationship, know that you are talking about the correlation. Next. So be mindful of that. Because if they were talking about the difference, then that one would have been correct. If they are talking about the relationship, then we're talking about the P or the coefficient of correlation. Okay, so let's look at another example. Which one of the following is suitable for representing age versus height of a group of children? Is it a scatter plot, a contingency table, or a histogram? One, two, or three? One. It is one. A contingency table, we're going to deal with contingency table on Saturday, and that will be our last session. We would have completed everything you need to know about Psych 3704. Um, a contingency table, it's used when we deal with a relationship between categorical values or new nominal values. A histogram is when you are visualizing one numerical value. So when you have two numerical values, the plot that you can use to visualize that is the scatter plot. Which of the following below is most likely to represent a Pearson correlation of R is equals to positive 0 0.85 between the variables X and Y if the measurements are plotted on a scatter plot? So which of this graph will represent that coefficient of correlation, the Pearson correlation? Is it graph A, graph B, and graph C? Number one, graph A. It is graph A. Graph A shows positive relationship, and because also the dots are closer to one, almost, it's not perfect, but the dots are closer to one another in a straight line. And that is why we will choose graph A, whereas with graph B, it shows a negative. So with graph B, it would have been a negative 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.85. And probably with this one, they would have said R of, whether even it's positive or negative, I wouldn't even know because there's no, almost there's no relationship. It's so constant. So this one might have been zero for all I care because it looks like as the value of X increases, the value of Y stays constant. They are not like moving in another direction of some sort. Okay, I think this is the last question. A negative correlation between X and Y implies that person scoring low on X will generally score mm, on Y. So think about it. A negative correlation would mean a person scoring low You can also, if you don't know what they mean, you can always draw yourself a graph like this and draw because this and draw a line because this says a negative correlation. So what they are saying here is as they score low, so low is on those values, what happens to the values on Y? If this is low and this is high, and this is low for y, and this is high for y. So what is the answer? Is it one, two, three? Is it low, either low or high, or is it three high? 
three, high. Three, it's high. Because if it's a negative correlation, as they score low on X, they score high on Y. If it was a positive, as they score low, they score low. So it would have been number one. And if there is no relationship, if they score low, it will either be low or high, right? Because it's constant, then it will be no relationship. And this is negative and this is positive. And that's how you can evaluate. In case you get sub questions like this in the exam, you know what to do. Okay. Oh, then we also have another question. A Pearson correlation coefficient R can take values ranging between, oh, I didn't discuss this with you, but based on the information I shared with you earlier on how we interpret R, I had negative one at the top and positive one at the bottom with zero in the middle where I said it is perfect relationship and then at the uh, perfect, perfect negative relationship. And then I also had perfect positive relationship. So based on this kind of information that I just voluntarily give you. Pearson correlation coefficient takes a range in values between the value of, is it between the value of zero and one, one to 10 or minus one to one? Number three, minus one to one. Minus one to one. Yes, that's it. And and that concludes today's session. We're going to end early. Are there any questions before I introduce myself and I give you time to leave? Are there any questions? Okay, in the absence of questions, for those who don't know, and it's their first time being here online with me, I'm representing Pambili Analytics. Um, it's a, an analytical company where we're bridging the gap in terms of data literacy and analytical skills. We offer a range of services, not only in terms of consulting, but in terms of our skills development training um, where we offer face-to-face -face sessions as well as online sessions. We are running a special this month, which end on the 31st this month of 150 per session per hour for a consultation. Otherwise, you are free or more than welcome to take any of our self-led training, but more specifically in terms of data literacy and analytical skills and research. If you want to uh, access the recordings or previous sessions, uh, there are uh, videos available or recordings available via YouTube. You can access them anytime from the previous sessions, last year's sessions, free of charge, open to everyone. Please subscribe to the channel so that you can get notification when more new videos are uploaded. Like our videos, share our channel so that more people can also benefit from the same content that you are benefiting from. If you want to gain access to the content that we just went through today, the videos of today, you need to join the channel as a member. So, and when you join, there are five membership uh, types that you can select. Please make sure before you click save or join, Make sure that you select the right membership. Only from loyalist membership, you will gain access to the recording 
as well as the notes for all the sessions that we had. Otherwise, feel free to contact us. They are our info. You can email us or WhatsApp us or visit our website. If there are no questions or comments, have a lovely evening. I will see you on Saturday. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>